Chapter 19 Another summer had come and still I had not speared the giant devilfish that lived near the cave. Every day during the spring, Rontu and I went to look for him. I would put the canoe in the water and paddle slowly through the cave from one opening to the other, often several times. I saw many devilfish there where the black water is streaked with light, but not the giant one. At last I gave up looking for him and began to gather abalones for winter. The red shells hold the sweetest meat and are best for drying, though the green ones and the black ones are also good. Because the red ones are the sweetest, starfish prey upon them. This star-shaped creature places itself over the shell of an abalone. With its five arms spread out against the rock to which the abalone is fastened, it holds the shell with its suckers and then begins to lift itself. The starfish pulls against the abalone shell, sometimes for days, holding on with its suckers and pushing up with its legs until little by little the heavy shell comes loose from the body. One morning we left the cave and paddled out to the reef which is joined to it. <coughs> for... Sorry. For many days I had gathered a few shellfish on the rocks at Cor Coral Cove, but I had been watching the reef and waiting for the right time to harvest. This is when there are a few starfish feeding, for they are as hard to pry loose from the abalone as an abalone is to pry from a rock. The tide was low and the reef rose far out of the water. Along its sides were great numbers of red abalones and very few starfish, so before the sun was high and filled with the bottom of the canoe. The day was windless, and since I had all I could carry, I tied the canoe, and with Ron too following me, I climbed onto the reef to look for fish to spear for supper. Blue dolphins were leaping beyond the kelp beds, and the kelp otter were playing at the games they were never tired of, and around me everywhere the gulls were fishing for scallops, which were numerous that summer. They grow on the floating kelp leaves and there are many, so many of them that much of the kelp near the reef had been dragged to the bottom. Still there were scallops that the gulls could reach and taking them in their beaks they would fly far above the reef and let them drop. The gulls would then soon swoop down to the rocks and pick the meat from the broken shells. Scallops fell on the reef like rain which amused me but not Ron too who could not understand what the gulls were doing. Dodging this way and that I went to the end of the reef where the biggest fish live. With a sinew line and a hook made of abalone shell, I caught two that had large heads and a long teeth, but are good to eat. I gave one to Ron, too, and on the way back to the canoe gathered purple sea urchins to use for dyeing. Ron, too, who was trotting along in front of me, suddenly dropped his fish and stood looking down over the edge of the reef. There, swimming in the clear water, was a devil fish. It was the same one I had been hunting for. It was the giant. Seldom did you see any devil fish here for they like deep places and the water along this part of the reef is shallow. Perhaps this one lived in the cave and came here only when he could not find food. Ron too made no sound. I fixed the head of the spear and with a long string that held it to my wrist, I then crawled back to the edge of the reef. The giant had not moved. He was floating just below the surface of the water and I could plainly see his eyes. They were the size of a small stones and stood out from his head with black rims and gold centers and in the center of a black spot like the eyes of a spirit I had once seen on a night that rain fell and lightning forked in the sky. Where my hands rested was a deep crevice, and in it a fish was hiding. The giant was half the length of my spear from the reef, but while I watched, one of his long arms ran out like a snake and fell its way into the crevice. It went past the fish and along the side of the rock, and then the end of it curled back. As the arm gently wound itself around the fish from behind, I rose to one knee and drove the spear. I aimed the giant's head, but though it was larger than my two fishes at a good target, I missed. The spear struck down the, through the water and slanted off. Instantly, a black cloud surrounded the devilfish. The only thing I could see of him was one long arm still grasping his prey. I jumped to my feet to pull in the spear, thinking that I might have a chance to throw it again. As I did so, the shaft bobbed back to the surface, and I saw that the barbed point had come loose. At the same moment, the string tightened. My grip on it broke, and aware that I had struck the devilfish, I quickly dropped the coils I held, for when the string runs out fast, it burns your hands or becomes entangled. The devilfish did not swim with fins or flippers, like other things in the sea. He takes water in through the hole in the front of his body and pushes the water out through two slits. When he is swimming slowly, you can see these two streams trailing out, but only then. When he moves fast, you can see nothing except a streak in the water. 
The quails I had dropped in the on the rock hopped, and I sang as they as they ran. Then there were no more of them. The string tightened on my wrist, and I, the, to loosen the shock, I leaped across the crevice in the direction the giant had taken. With the string in both hands, but still fastened to my wrist, I braced my feet on the slippery rock, and I leaned backwards. The string snapped tight with the weight of the devil fish. It began to stretch, and fearing that it might break, I walked forward, yet I made him pull me every step. He was moving f toward the cave along the edge of the reef. The cave was a good distance away. If he got there, I would surely lose him. The canoe was tied just in front of me. Once I was in it, I could let him pull me until he grew tired, but there was no way to untie the canoe and still hold on to the string. Ron, too, all this time, was running up and down the reef, barking and leaping at me, which made my task even harder. Step by stop, step, I walked forward until the devilfish was in the deep water close to the cave. He was so close that I had to stop, even if the sinew, sinew broke and I lost him. I therefore braced myself and did not move. The sinew stretched throwing off drops of water. I could hear it stretch, and I was sure it would break. I did not feel it cutting into my hands, though they bled. <laughs> the pool suddenly lessened, and I was sure that he was gone, but the next instant I saw the string cutting the water in, the, in a wide circle. He was swimming off from the cave and the reef towards some rocks that were about twice the length of the string away. He would be safe there, too, from among them were many places to hide. I pulled in half the string while he was moving toward the rocks, but soon had to let it out. It grew tight and began to stretch. The water here was only a little way over my waist, and I let myself down over the reef. There was a sandbar not far from the rocks, and stepping carefully on the bottom, which was full of holes, I slowly made my way toward it. Ron, too, swam alongside my, by my side. I reached the sandbar before the devilfish could hide himself in the rocks. The string held, and he turned about and once more swam toward the cave. Twice again he did this. Each time, as he came up in the shallow water, I walked backward across the sandbar so he would not see me and pulled on me the string with all my strength. The giant slid up on the sand. He lay with his arms spread out partly in the water, and I thought he was dead. Then I saw his eyes moving. Before I could shout a warning, Ron too had rushed forward and seized him. But the devilfish was too heavy to lift or shake. As Ron too's jaws saw another hold, three of my many... Three of the many arms wound itself around his neck. Devilfish are only dangerous when in the water where they can fasten themselves to you with their long arms. These arms have rows of suckers underneath them and they can drag you under and hold you there until you drown. But even on the land the devilfish can injure you for he was strong and does not die very quickly. The giant was flailing his arms struggling to get back in the water. Little by little he was dragging Ron too with him. I could no longer use the string because it was round around Rontu's legs. The whalebone knife I used for prying abalones from the rocks was tied to a thong in my waist. The blade was thick at the point but had a sharp edge. I dropped the coils of string and fastened the knife as I ran. I ran past the devilfish and I got between him and the deep water. So many of his arms were flailing that it was useless to cut any one of them. One struck me on the leg and burned like a whip. Another, which Ron too had chewed off, lay wriggling, wiggling at the edge of the water as if it were looking for something to fasten onto. The head rose out of the twisting arms like a giant stalk. The gold eyes with their black rims were fixing on me. Above the sounds of the waves and the water splashing and Ron too's barking, I could hear the snapping of his beak, which was sharper than the knife I held in my hand. I drove the knife down into his body, and as I did this, I was suddenly covered, or so it seemed, with a countless number of leeches sucking at my skin. Fortunately, one hand was free, the hand that held the knife, and again and again I struck down through the tough hide. The suckers, which were fastened to me and pained greatly, lessened their hold. Slowly the arms stopped moving and then grew limp. I tried to drag the devilfish out of the water, but my strength was gone. I did not even go back to the reef for my canoe, though I did take the shaft and the head of the spear, which had cost me much labor and the sinew line. It was night before Ron too and I got back to the house. Ron too had a gash on his nose from the giant's beak, and I had many cuts and bruises. I saw two more giant fish sorry, two more giant devil fish along the reef that summer, but I did not try to spear them. So you can kind of see there in, in this story, in this chapter, we could almost name this chapter, you know, if we if we put titles on it, the hunting of the devil fish. And I think she learned her lesson. As much as she wanted it, it's probably not worth the effort for the amount of fighting that the devilfish did to get it back. 
Chapter 20 I gathered two more canoe loads of abalone soon after that, most of the sweet red ones, which I cleaned and carried to the house. Along the south part of the fence where the sun shone most of the day, I built long shelves out of branches and put the meat up to dry. Abalones are larger than your hand and twice as thick when fresh, but they shrink small in the sun, so you have to dry many. In the old days on the island, there were children to keep away the gulls, which would rather feast on abalones than anything else. In one morning, if the meat was left unguarded, they could fly off with a month's harvest. At first, whenever I went to the spring or to the beach, I left Rontu behind to chase them off. But he did not like this and howled all the time I was gone. Finally, I tied strings to some of the abalone shells and hung them from poles. The insides of the shells were bright and catch the sun, and they turned one way and another in the wind. After that, I had a little trouble with the gulls. I also caught small fish in a net and I had made and hung them up to dry for the winter light. With meat drying on the shelves and the shells flashing and turning in the wind and the strings of fish hanging on the fins, the yard looked as if a whole village were living there on the headland instead of just Rontu and me. Every morning after I had gathered food for winter, we went out on the sea. At the end of summer, I would gather roots and seeds to store, but now there was nothing that needed to be done. We went many places those first days of summer, to the beach where the sea elephants lived, to Black Cave, which was even larger than the first cave we found, and to Tall Rock, where the cormorants roosted. Tall Rock was more than a league from the island and was black and shimmering because it was covered with cormorants. I killed ten of the birds the first time we went there, and I skinned and fleshed them and put them out to dry. For some day, I wanted to make myself a skirt of cormorant feathers. Black Cave was on the south coast of the island, near the place where the canoes were stored. In front of the cave was a high ledge of rocks surrounded by deep kelp beds, and I would have paddled by it if I had not seen a, a seahawk fly out. The sun was in the west, and I had a long way to go to reach home, but I was curious about the hawk and the place he lived in. The opening of the cave was small, like the one in the cave under the headland, and Ron, too, and I had to crouch low to get through. Weak light came from outside, and I saw that we were in a room with a black, shining walls that curved high overhead. At the far end of the room was another small opening. It was long and very dark, but when we reached the end of it, we were in another room which was larger than the first and lit with a shaft of light. The light came from the sun, which shone down through a jagged rock in the ceiling. Seeing the sun shining down and the black shadows drifting over the walls, Rontu barked and then began to howl. The sound echoed through the cave like the howling of a whole pack of dogs. It sent a cold feeling down my back. Be quiet, I shouted, putting my hand over his jaws. My words echoed and echoed in the room. I turned the canoe around and started back toward the opening. Above it on the deep ledge that ran from one side of the room to the other, my gaze fell upon a row of strange figures. There must have been two dozen of them standing against the black wall. They were as tall as I, with long arms and legs and short bodies made of reeds and cloth and gull feathers. Each one had eyes fashioned of round or oblong disc of abalone shell, but the rest of their faces were blank. The eyes glittered down at me, moved as the light on the water moved and was reflected upon them. They were more alive than the eyes of those who were alive. In the middle of the group was seated a seated figure, a skeleton. It sat leaning against the wall with its knees drawn up and its fingers, which were raised to its mouth, a flute of pelican bone. There were other things there on the ledge in the shadows among the standing figures, but having drifted far back into the room, I again paddled toward the opening. I had forgotten that the tide was coming in. To my great surprise, the opening had narrowed, and it was too small now for me to get through. We would have to stay there in the room until the tide went out, until dawn came. I paddled to the far end of the cave, and I did not <coughs> look at, back at the glittering eyes of the figures on the ledge. I crouched in the bottom of the canoe and watched the shaft of light grow weak. The opening out to the sea grew smaller, and finally it disappeared. Night came, and a star showed through the crevice overhead. <coughs> this star passed out of sight, and another took its place. The tide lifted the canoe higher and higher in the room, and as the water lapped against the walls, it sounded like the soft music of a flute. It played many tunes through the night, <coughs> long night, and I slept a little, watching the stars change. I knew that the skeleton who sat on the ledge playing his flute was one of the, my many ancestors, and the others were with the glittering eyes, though only images were two, but still I f was sleepless and afraid. <coughs> with the first light, another high tide almost setting, we left the cave. 
I did not look up at those standing quietly on the ledge or at the flute player playing for them, but paddled fast out of the morning sea, nor did I look back. I suppose this cave once had a name, <coughs> I said to Ron too, who was as glad as I was to be free, but I have never heard of it or heard it spoken about. We will call it Black Cave, and never in all of our days go there again. When we were back from our voyage to Tall Rock, I hid the canoe in the cave below the headland. It was hard work, but each time I would lift the canoe from the water and onto the ledge, even though I planned to go out the next morning. Two summers had come and gone, and the Aleut hunters had not returned, yet during these days I always looked for them. At dawn, as Ron Tu and I went to the, down to the cliff, I would watch the ocean for their sails. The summer air was clear, and I could see many leagues. Whenever we went into the canoe, I would never be gone longer than a half a day. On the way home, I always paddled close to the shore and looked for them. It was the last time that we went to Tall Rock that the Aleuts came. <coughs> I had hidden the canoe and climbed the cliff with the ten cormorant skins slung over my back. At the top of the cliff, I stood for a while, gazing at the sea. There were some small clouds on the water. One of them, the smallest, did not look like the others. As I watched, I saw that it was a ship. The sun made bright scales on the water, but I could cl see clearly. There were two sails, and it was the ship coming toward the island. For a long time, I could not tell the color of the sails. I wondered if it could be the white men, though now I thought about them little and seldom looked for them. I left the cormorants hanging on the fence <coughs> and went to the rock of the headland. I could see no better from the rock because the sun was low and the whole ocean covered, was covered with light. Then as I stood there, I remembered that the white men's ship would come from the east. This one had come from the different direction, from the north. I still was not sure that it belonged to the Aleuts, but I decided to pack things that I would take to the cave in the ravine. There was much to take. <coughs> my two birds, the skirt I had made, the stone utensils, my beads and earrings, the coramant feathers, and all of the, my baskets and weapons. The abalones were not yet dry, so I'd have to leave them. <coughs> when I had packed everything and put it aside beside the hole under the fence, I went back to the headland. I lay on the rock so that I would not be seen and peered over its rim toward the north. For a moment I did not find the ship, and then I saw that it had traveled faster than I thought that it would. It was already rounding the kelp bed close to the rocks of Coral Cove. The last of the sun shone on the ship on the bow, which was made like a beak of a bird, and on the two red sails. I knew that the Aleuts would not come on shore in the dark, and that I had until morning to carry my things to the cave, but I did not wait. Most of the night I worked making two trips to the cave. At dawn, when everything had been moved, I went back to the house for the last time. <clears throat> and then I buried the ashes of my fires and threw sand over the shelves in the floor. I took the shells I had put up on to scare the gulls and tossed them and the abalones over the shelf or over the cliff. At last, with a pelican wig, I brushed away my marks on my feet. When I had finished, it looked as if no one had lived there for a long time. <clears throat> and by now, the sun was up and I climbed onto the rock. The ship lay at anchor in the cove. Canoes were bringing goods to the shore, and some were out in the kelp beds beginning to hunt for otter. There was a fire on the shore, and beside it, a girl. She was cooking something, and I could see the fire shining on her hair. I did not stay long on the headland. Always in the past, I had gone to the ravine by a different way so as not to wear a trail. This time I went off toward the west along the cliff, and then doubled back through the brush, being careful to leave no tracks. Ron Tu's prints did not matter because the Aleuts knew that there were dogs on the island. The cave was very dark and I had trouble getting Ron Tu to go through the small opening. Only after I had crawled in and out several times would he follow me. I closed the opening with stones and since I was tired lay down and slept all, day, all that day. I slept until I, until I could see the stars shining between the cracks in the rocks.